Torque and rotational equilibrium are going to be the topic of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which when completed will cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now with Newton's laws of motion, the first law gave us the condition for equilibrium, that the sum of the forces acting on an object was zero, and we're going to see an analogous setup here for rotational equilibrium. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So we want to start this off by talking about the conditions for rotational equilibrium, but I first actually want to compare them to the conditions for equilibrium brought back up in chapter four. And so back in chapter four, according to Newton's first law, we said uh, the sum of the forces equals zero. There's no net force acting on an object. It will either be moving at constant velocity or be not in motion whatsoever, have a constant velocity of zero, if you will. And so we said again that the sum of the forces were zero for a body in equilibrium. Well, what's going to be new with rotational equilibrium, it's not just the sum of the forces that are going to be zero, but it's going to be the sum of the torques that are going to be zero for a body in rotational equilibrium now. And so if you've got a one-dimensional problem, these will be the two equations you're going to set up. But if you've got a two-dimensional problem, similar to what we did with, with objects in uh, equilibrium back in chapter four, you're going to break it up into x and y components. And you'll have the sum of the forces in the x direction adding up to zero, and you'll have the sum of the forces in the y direction adding up to zero. So, and then again, with rotational equilibrium, you'll additionally have one more equation where the sum of the torques equals zero as well. And these are going to be the equations you're setting up. So you're going to set up a free body diagram, set up the equations, and we've just got one additional equation we're setting up effectively. Uh, and whether it be a one-dimensional or two-dimensional problem, it's just that one additional sum of the torques equaling zero. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit. And just a, a quick reminder here that torque is the perpendicular force times the lever arm or the perpendicular component of the force times the lever arm. So just keep that in mind. So and we've got to talk when we're, when we're setting up a problem like the one we're about to do here. In fact, let's read that real quick. So what must be the weight of the child on the left-hand side of the seesaw for it to be in rotational equilibrium? So we've got a child on the right-hand side, two meters to the right of this fulcrum. Who, uh, who has a mass of 30.0 kilograms. And we wanna know what's the mass of the child on the left if this system, the seesaw, is in rotational equilibrium. All right, so the first thing I wanna do is set up a proper free body diagram and all the forces acting on this seesaw. And so in this case, we have the 30 kilogram mass child has a weight associated with it. The child of unknown mass here also has a weight associated with it. The seesaw itself has a weight, and as long as it's uniformly distributed, which is the assumption I'm gonna make here, so that weight is gonna be right at the center here. So these are not all the same weight, but I'm not gonna mark them differently here. Uh, we'll, we'll put actual formulas in. And then we're gonna have a normal force for where the seesaw hits this fulcrum, that contact force right there. And so those are our four forces. And what's nice is all these forces are in the vertical direction, let's say the y direction, which is gonna make this a one dimensional problem. Now, before we treat this formally, I also want to point out that intuitively, you probably are already figuring out what's going on here. So, but we want to put it in the context of how we should structure any problem, even one that maybe we can't intuitively reason out. So, so but if you intuitively reason this out, you might be like, well, the 30 kilogram child on the right is going to kind of want to make this seesaw rotate clockwise, and they're two meters from the fulcrum. So the child on the left-hand side, they're only one meter from the fulcrum. Well, torque is proportional to lever arm. And so in this case, if I don't want this thing to rotate, if I want it to be in rotational equilibrium, well then the torque from the child on the right, which is gonna lead to clockwise rotation, has to be perfectly balanced by the torque by the child on the left, which would cause counterclockwise rotation. And that's totally true. And so if the lever arm is half as big on this side, well then you have to reason that it needs twice the force. And since weight is proportional to mass, that means twice the mass over here as well. And it's gonna to need to be 60.0 kilograms. And if you reason that out, fantastic. So, but now we wanna formally say, okay, well, how would you set this up when you can't quite intuitively reason one out? But that's exactly what you should be thinking if you already were, you wanna to get to that point as well. All right, so we wanna first start off by setting up that the sum of the torques equals zero. 
So, and here's the deal. You can actually pick your axis of rotation anywhere. It doesn't have to actually be where this system is likely to have an actual axis rotation. The key is this, it's not actually rotating. Whether I say, oh, it's likely to rotate about the axis rotation right where it's in contact with the fulcrum, the seesaw's in contact there. It is in contact there, that is probably where it would rotate. In fact, it's definitely where it rotate, but you can pick the axis of rotation anywhere along that seesaw. It's not actually rotating in this problem. So, however, even though in principle you can make it anywhere and the math will work out, so sometimes we don't have uh, all the, the information we need to know to actually pick anywhere, or sometimes it's just more mathematically convenient to choose one location uh, over another, as we'll see here. So, but most of the time you'll find out that probably choosing, uh, you know, the place where it hits a fulcrum like this, where it's most likely to be the actual axis rotation, odds are that's a pretty good place to choose if you don't know where else to start. All right. So in this case, in our case, it actually has to be the place where we start. So because there's two things we don't know, we don't know the weight of the platform and we don't know the normal force either. And in fact, we don't have enough information to actually know either of them in this problem. And so if we try to pick the axis of rotation anywhere other than that fulcrum, we're gonna run into an issue. But by choosing it at the fulcrum right there, we're gonna find out that the normal force and the weight both have a lever arm of zero. And if your lever arm is zero, then your contribution to the torque is also gonna be zero, and you're gonna drop right out of our equation where the sum of the torques equals zero. And that's what we need to happen because we just don't know those forces. And you'll find out this is pretty common as well. When you don't know a force, then maybe where it's acting might be the place you choose to be the axis of rotation so that it falls out of the sum of the torques equation. All right, so let's start this here. So one thing you should know is that we're gonna choose again this middle point of being our axis of rotation. So anything that causes a clockwise rotation, we're gonna consider negative and counterclockwise positive. So just like if you were looking at the first quadrant, the second quadrant, the third quadrant, and the fourth quadrant, where we go from zero to 90 degrees to 180 degrees, to 270 degrees and up to 360, going around counterclockwise is positive. Then anything going clockwise is negative. And so by default, we kind of usually hold that same convention. Now you could get the problem right either way, it's just convention to typically define counterclockwise as positive, clockwise as negative, just FYI. So in fact, I'll leave that up for a sec. So in this case, if you look around that axis rotation, the weight of this uh, 30 kilogram child should cause it to want to rotate in a clockwise fashion. We'll define that as being negative. The weight of the child of unknown mass here would cause it to want to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, and we'll make that a positive contribution to torque. And again, we'll control the signs here when we set this up. All right, so we'll start with the positive one first. And in this case, we're gonna have the mass that we don't know times gravity, that's weight, and then times a lever arm distance of one meter. So in this case, what's nice is that notice our seesaw is perfectly horizontal. All our forces are perfectly vertical, which makes them perfectly perpendicular. And we don't have to worry about sine theta and getting just the, the vertical component in this case. They are all perfectly vertical. So that makes this a little bit easier as well. All right, and then we'll subtract off. So the torque associated with our 30.0 kilogram child, so that's gonna be 30.0 kilograms times gravity and then times a lever arm distance of 2.0 meters. So, and this all adds up to zero. I'm gonna get this out of the way. It's just cluttering my board here. All right, so there's the sum of our torques equation. And again, good place to always start. One thing to note, and this happens pretty commonly, it's happening here, is that every term has gravity in it. So, and then on the product, or on the, the uh, right-hand side of the equation, we've just got zero. And so I can divide the entire equation by G, because zero divided by G is still zero. So I divide each of these by G, and G just kind of cancels out of the entire equation. Make the math easier. Now, if you leave it in and multiply by 9.8 meters per second squared and stuff like that, there's nothing wrong with that. You'll still get the right answer, but we can save ourselves a little bit of work on the math here. And so in this case, we're gonna have mass times 1.0 meters. We'll add this to the other side is gonna equal 30.0, that's not a 30.0, let's try that again, 30.0 kilograms times 2.0 meters. So and this is a common result. So 
Uh, oftentimes when I'm doing a problem in my head, I actually start right here. I don't even start with the sum of the torques adding up to zero. There's only two objects and they're causing rotations or at least they would cause rotations in opposite directions, but the system is in equilibrium, then I'll just set them equal to each other. So, and kind of skip this step. Now it's not proper, but again, it's just kind of my, my jump in steps in my head. But if I'm formally setting it up on, on paper, it's start sum of the torques equals zero. So this is the first equation we'd set up. And in this case, notice we actually have all that we need to solve for the mass we were looking for. So we haven't even set up the sum of the forces equation, so, but we don't need to. And again, most of the time, and I'd say probably 75% of the time, the variable you're probably solving for will probably be able to do with just the sum of the torques equation, but not every time. And you should be prepared to set up that sum of the forces equation as well. So if we set up that one as well, so sum of the forces, and in this case, they're all in the y direction. Whether you want to write it as all in the y direction or not is up to you. So there's only one direction in this problem, it turns out. But those some of the forces, well, in this case, the only force pointing up is the normal force. All the other forces are pointing down. And so in this case, we've got the weight of the, mis of, of, of the unknown mass child, so minus mg. So we've got the weight, which we don't know, of the seesaw. And then we've got the weight of the 30 kilogram child as well. And in this case, that's, that is the sum of the forces. Again, that sum of the forces has to add up to zero. Cool, and we see from this lovely equation here that we have lots of variables. In fact, we have more variables than we uh, can solve for. Because we're gonna solve for mass in the sum of the torques equation to have that one, but we still have two variables we don't know, and we don't have enough equations to solve for them. We have actually no way to solve for the weight of the seesaw or the normal force in this problem. It's not something that can be asked. But we can solve for that mass using that sum of the torques equation. And so we'll just divide through by one meter, and we'll find out that the mass here, so, 30 times two is 60, and then divide the one meter out, and you're gonna get a mass of 60.0, actually, let's make this just two sig figs, 60 kilograms, and again, I hate putting a line over zeros to make it significant, which you can do, but I might also just be inclined to write it in scientific notation and make it 6.0 times 10 to the first kilograms as well. And there's the answer. And here's how you'd properly set this up. Now, again, if you were solving this and you just kind of intuitively looked at this and said, that kid's causing, you know, counter or clockwise rotation, that's negative. This kid's gonna cause uh, counterclockwise rotation, that's positive. Let's just make them equal and opposite. And you kind of just jumped straight to here and said, yeah, so if this kid has half the lever arm, he's gonna need twice the mass and twice the weight. Done. Great. Love for you to be there, but Real instructive to set up the sum of the torques and sum of the force equation for some of the harder questions we're about to encounter. So the next question says, a 6.0 meter long 10 kilogram platform whose mass is uniformly distributed is suspended by a cable attached to its center. Right at the middle there. Three masses are in turn suspended from the platform as shown in the diagram. For the system to be in rotational equilibrium, what must be the value of the unknown mass and then also what is the tension in the cable? So two questions here. So, all right, now there is a way for you to reason this out really quickly. Now, if you just kind of assume, and again, with rotational equilibrium, we can assume the axis of rotation is anywhere. Well, if you just kind of assume it's where it's hanging right there, so it simplifies the problem immensely because not only is the tension force then having a zero lever arm, so but also this platform which has a 10 kilogram mass, its weight, which we can envision being concentrated at the center, also is gonna have a zero, zero lever arm and neither one of those will therefore cause any contribution to the torque. And so then the only thing causing contributions to the torque are the three masses. And if you kind of take a look and say, well, based on that being the axis of rotation, this one's gonna, the 25 kilogram one's gonna cause it to wanna rotate in a clockwise direction, that's negative but the 15 kilogram one's gonna pull it down this way, that would be counterclockwise, that's gonna be positive. And then this one, same thing, also positive, counterclockwise rotation. And you just say, well, for it to be in rotational equilibrium, then the positives have to equal the negatives in terms of torque. And if you set that up, you'd say, well, over here we have 25 kilograms times G times a lever arm distance of three. And that's the negative contribution, 25 kilograms times gravity times three. Over here, we've got 15 G times one. And over here, we're gonna have M G times a total lever arm distance of three. 
and you say, well, what does M need to be here? Well, over here, we've got a total of 75G. Over here, we've got 15G here, and we're gonna have 3MG here. And I can see that we gotta balance 75G over here. This has got a total up to 75G. Well, we've already got 15G here in the term we know. We need 60 more G. And to get 60 more G, mass has gotta be 20. And you could have reasoned it out that way. And again, I hope that's exactly either where you're getting to or, or where you're currently at. So uh, definitely not a place I would expect you to be at this point, but I would love for you to get there. However, this is not the proper setup again, but a way you could reason it out if you're starting to understand these torque questions a little better. So, well, let's take a look at how you actually more properly should set this problem up. So once again, conditions for rotational equilibrium, the first is that the sum of the torques add up to zero. And once again, we have to choose the axis of rotation. And again, we can choose it to be anywhere for a system of equilibrium. This thing's not actually rotating. And so you don't have to choose the actual place it's likely to rotate, but any place along this lovely platform. So, and once again, if we set up the free body diagram, we've got a weight here, here, and here. And again, the 10 kilograms of the platform itself, we can envision being concentrated to the center there. And then we've got a tension pointing upward in the cable itself. And so there's our free body diagram. Nicely enough, again, this is a one-dimensional problem. All the forces are vertical. They're in the y direction, if you will. So that's gonna make this a little bit easier. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, in choosing the axis of rotation, well, this is the weight we wanna solve for. If I make the axis of rotation, the proposed axis of rotation right above him, he gets eliminated from the sum of the torques equation, but he's the one I wanna solve for. I don't want him eliminated from that equation. So we definitely don't wanna make it there. So if we look at the rest though, well, we know this weight right here. We know this weight right here. We know this weight right here. We don't know the tension here. So making it at the location where one of the forces we don't know acts might not be a bad idea, which again would be the actual, probably likely, uh, most likely axis rotation right where the cable is suspending that platform. So it makes a logical choice here, but we'll see in principle, we could have chose anywhere at the end of this problem, but that's what we're gonna choose, right in the middle there once again. And so we set up the sum of the torques equation. We're gonna see that the line of reasoning we had set up here is kinda of gonna show up pretty much in, in very similar fashion with the sum of the torques equaling zero. Uh, and once again, so this is gonna be leading to clockwise rotation. That's gonna be negative. And this one to counterclockwise and counterclockwise, these will both be positive. And so in this case, then we'll start with the positives and we've got mass times gravity. So for the unknown mass times a lever arm distance of three meters. And once again, these are all perfectly perpendicular being vertical to our horizontal platform to our lever arm. And so we don't have to worry about sine thetas or anything like that. We just plug the forces in this case, the weights right in. So that's positive. The next one's going to be positive as well. And that's 15 kilograms. times gravity, in this case times a lever arm distance of one meter. And now the other one's gonna be negative, and that's the 25 kilograms times G, and now times a lever arm distance of three meters. And this all adds up to zero. Cool, one thing to note, and this happened in the last one as well, is that every term has gravity in it, so, and on the other side, it's just zero, and zero divided by gravity is still zero, and so we can divide gravity out of this equation as well. And again, you don't have to, it just makes the math a little bit easier uh, in the process. And so if we set this up here, we're gonna end up with uh, three meters times m, and I'm gonna leave out some of the units here from here on out. So, but three m equals, we'll move these to the other side, so we've got 15 times one minus 25 times three, 15 times one is 15, 25 times three is uh, in this case, negative 75. So 15 minus 75 would be negative 60. Adding it to the other side is gonna make it positive 60. So, and dividing by three is gonna lead us to a mass of 20 kilograms. So, and again, we probably want two sig figs based on the distances supplied, which I would again prefer to make 2.0 times 10 to the first kilograms. And notice we were able to actually solve for the mass. We haven't even set up the other equation yet. So, but we can, we can set up the sum of the forces equals zero. 
Uh, and in this case, we need to, because the second question is, what's the tension in the cable? And based on where we chose the axis of rotation, that didn't even show up in our sum of the torques equation, but we were able to solve for the mass. And so now we'll go there. Sum of the forces equals zero. And, and in this case, you could write it's in the y direction, but that's the only direction, so you don't have to. And so in this case, we look at those forces. The only force that points up is the tension in the cable. All the rest point down. In fact, you can kind of look at this very simplistically and there's nothing wrong with it. These are all weights pointing down. The tension in the cable is the thing that has to hold the, the weight of everything up. And you could just be like, well, great. That's 20 kilograms we now know. That's 15 kilograms, that's 10 kilograms, that's 25 kilograms. That's a total of 70 kilograms. Let me verify that. 40, 50, 60, 70, yeah, 70 kilograms. It has to hold all 70 kilograms up. And so the total weight, 70 kilograms times G, that's what it has to balance. And that's exactly what we'll find out from this sum of the forces equation. So T minus 20 G, and I'll leave off the unit just to make this a little bit easier. So mass times gravity, 20 kilograms times G, minus 15 G, minus 10 G, minus 25 G equals zero. And so the tension's gonna come out, adding these all the other side to 70 kilograms times G, just like we said a second ago. And in this case, that tension, let the calculator do some work for us here. So 70 times 9.8, is gonna get us 686 Newtons. But with two sig figs, we'll round that up to 690 Newtons. There's your tension, and we've solved both of them, setting up the two equations we were supposed to for a one-dimensional problem. Now, one thing I wanna verify with this before we move on is just to show that again, in principle, you can make the proposed axis of rotation anywhere. Now, there might be a best choice for where to put it. There might be some places that don't work in trying to solve for what you're solving for. But again, I just wanna make sure you realize that the math will indeed work out. And so in this case, I'm just gonna say, what if we made the axis of rotation right over here at the left-hand end? Now that we know everything, we wouldn't have done that because we couldn't have solved for the mass that way. But after the fact, I just wanna go back and verify that the sum of the torques are still going to add up to zero if you make that the proposed axis of rotation. And so let's set that up. So sum of the torques equals zero. Well, in this case, the weight of our uh, 20 kilogram mass that we found here has a zero lever arm. It's not gonna show up in this equation. We'll leave him out, okay? So, but we do have this guy here and notice all three of these weights are gonna cause rotation around the proposed axis in the clockwise direction and be negative. The only one that would cause it to rotate in the opposite direction is this tension that's pulling up. And so he's the only positive term, we'll start with him. And so in this case, we're gonna have the tension and it's operating at a distance of three meters. So and I'm gonna leave off all the units, not get lost on the algebra here. So tension times three meters. So and that tension again was the 690 or really 686 Newtons as we'll see. And then we'll subtract off all the other torque terms. And so in this case, we've got 15 G and that's times a, a lever arm in this case of two meters minus 10 G times a lever arm distance now of three meters for the platform's weight itself. And then minus 25 G times a lever arm now of the entire six meters. And that all adds up to zero. Uh, and in this case, again, we know the tension, so let's plug that back in. So that was 686 Newtons. So, uh, and the question is, does this really all add up to zero? Because it should, and again, my, my argument is that if it does indeed all add up to zero, then we've just verified that we could have proposed the axis of rotation to be anywhere for a system in equilibrium. All right, so 686 times three is 2,058 Newtons. So 15 times 9.8 times two is 294 Newtons. 10 times 9.8 times three is also 294 Newtons, oddly enough. And then 25 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times the lever arm of six meters is 1470 Newtons. And 
The question is, does the again this equal zero? And so if we take 2058 minus 294 minus 294 minus 1470, lo and behold, it does indeed equal zero. And we verified that we could have put the proposed axis of rotation anywhere, and at least the math would have worked out. Again, we couldn't have actually solved for the unknown mass had we put it there, but I'm just again verifying that it works mathematically. So the last problem we're gonna look at is a common one involving what we call a boom. So in a boom here is uh, uh, something hooked up on a hinge to a wall that's allowed to rotate freely. And you've got a cable hung over the end of it that's gonna support a weight. In this case, in this case, you used a hung a sign, but there's bigger ones that can be used as platforms for larger things and stuff like that on the side of a building and things of that sort. But the boom weighs 20.0 kilograms, the sign's gonna weigh 10.0 kilograms, and the cable uh, attached to the boom that's attached to the wall up here is gonna be at an angle of 30 degrees here. So question says, a 10.0 kilogram sign is hung from the end of a two meter long 20 kilogram boom that is suspended by a cable attached to the wall as in the following figure. What is the tension in the cable? And let's label that distance. The picture on the study guide actually had this labeled as 2.0 meters. All right, so again, what is the tension in the cable? And so in this case, this thing is in rotational equilibrium. So, and if you were hoping to solve another one of these intuitively, you were probably going to struggle. So we should then go back to tried and true and just say, okay, what are the conditions for rotational equilibrium? Some of the torques equal zero, some of the forces equal zero. And so we'll start with that sum of the torques equaling zero. So let's draw that free body diagram now. So everything acting on the lovely boom itself. Well, the boom itself has weight. So we'll concentrate it at its center and that's mg weight. So we've got the weight of the 10 kilogram mass here as well, mg. So we've got the tension in the cable here, so, which is gonna be a problem because it's not perfectly in the x or y directions. We'll have to split it up into components and all of a sudden we've, we'll quickly realize this is a two-dimensional problem. It'll be a little bit longer than the ones we've looked at before. A couple other things we've gotta realize is that one, where the hinge is attached here, so this cable is pulling this way on it, so, but the wall is providing a normal force back in the opposite direction, a contact force back in the opposite direction. Now the not so obvious force that you might not see though, is that there's also, it turns out, a normal force in the vertical direction right here as well. And you might be like, uh, where Chad? So, well, this thing is attached, this hinge is attached to the wall. So, and this platform is resting on at least the bolts that that hinge is attached to the wall with, providing a normal force in the opposite direction. So it's not maybe intuitively obvious, but it's definitely there is a normal force being applied right there. Because we have two normal forces, maybe we label one as X and one as Y based on the directions they are operating in. We should also realize that the tension here, so has both X and Y components. And if we split it up into components, because we're definitely going to need to, so the X component here is gonna be T cosine of 30 degrees, the adjacent side, and the Y component is gonna be T sine of 30 degrees. Let's just keep that in mind. All right, so now we've got a complete free body diagram. We've got to choose an axis of rotation so we can set up the sum of the torques equation. And you might be like, well, how about the hinge? And I would say, great choice. One, obviously that is the place where it would likely rotate, where the only place it could rotate technically. So, but also we don't know either one of these normal forces and having them act, which is right at the hinge, with, that would give them a lever arm of zero, which would eliminate from our torques equation. So what we really want to solve for is that tension right there. So I'll make our life a little bit easier in all likelihood. So uh, in this case, uh, one other thing to look at, so the remaining forces that will have lever arms are the tension, or at least a component of the tension, So and then the two different weights. Now the weights are gonna wanna pull this thing to rotate in a clockwise direction. Those are gonna be negative contributions to the torque, but the tension's pulling it back up, making it wanna rotate in the counterclockwise direction that will be positive. We should also realize that again, with torque, we want the perpendicular component of the force. So in this case, perpendicular to our boom is the Y component, T sine 30. That's the one that's gonna show up. All right, so the only positive contribution is by the force T sine 30, and its lever arm distance here is the full two meter length where it acts. All right, then we got the weight of the boom itself. That's 20 kilograms times gravity. So, and then times a distance of one meter from our proposed hinge. 
So and then we've got the 10 kilogram mass hanging off the end times gravity and then times a lever arm of two meters. And this all adds up to zero. If we look here, a couple things. One, we can't actually ignore gravity like we have in the last ones because we have a term over here that doesn't have gravity in it. So we can't divide gravity out like we've done in the other ones. We're actually gonna have to multiply by 9.8 here and 9.8 meters per second squared there. Can't, div can't divide it out, can't get rid of it. Uh, other thing to realize is that the only thing we don't know in this equation is the tension. And that's the thing that's we're being asked. So if we're like, okay, we set up the sum of the tension equation. And if you're like, well, now we need to set up the sum of the forces equation. And it's not just equation, but equations, one in the x direction, one in the y direction. Again, we have a two dimensional problem. So we actually have three equations to set up. But if all you were being asked for is the tension, you wouldn't have to set up the other two because you already got enough information to solve for what you're looking for. So one, we are gonna go solve for tension real quick, but then we are still gonna set up the other two equations to instructive. And we'll find out that that's we could use those other two equations to figure out these two normal forces if we had been asked them. So let's solve for this tension here. So in this case, sine of 30 is one half. And so here, one half times two is one. And so we're just gonna be left with tension, if you will. And it's not really just tension. It's tension with an, an extra factor of meters. Um, so it's gonna be really in Newton meters at this point. Uh, and then we'll move everything over to the other side, add it to the other side. And so we're gonna have tension equals in this case, we'll let our calculator do some work for us. We've got 20 times 9.8 times one, it's 196, or in this case, technically negative 196, that will add to the other side. And then we've got 10 times 9.8 times two. So, and that's also negative 196, and uh, negative 196 times negative 196, or plus negative 196 is negative 392, but we're adding it to the other side to get positive 392. Cool, and technically this would have come out as Newton meters. So kilograms times meters per second squared is Newton meters, but then we're dividing out the meters part that was left over on the units here, essentially, uh, and getting just Newtons. And tension simply equals 392 Newtons. Uh, in this case, we'd have to round that to two sig figs based on two units being provided there, and technically I guess we'd round this to 390 Newtons. Okay, so moving on from there, uh, if you were asked to solve for either one or both of those normal forces, we've now got two more equations to set up. So we've got some of the forces in the x direction equals zero. And so in this case, uh, x direction forces really only got two. We've got the normal force in the x direction and then we've got a component of the tension T cosine 30 as well. The normal force points in the positive x direction, the T cosine 30 in the negative x direction and that'll determine our sign. So we're gonna have that normal force in the x direction positive minus T cosine 30 in that negative x direction adds up to zero. And in this case, because we already solved for the tension, we could plug it in and solve for that normal force had it been asked. We've also got some of the forces in the y direction adds up to zero. And if we look, we've got a few forces now. We've got T sine 30 pointing up. We've got the normal force in the y direction over here pointing up and then these two weights pointing down. So we'll start with the ones that point up. We've got the normal force in the y direction plus T sine 30. Those are your positive ones. And then minus 20 kilograms times G minus 10 kilograms times G adds up to zero. And once again, we can't get rid of G here because these two terms don't have it. But we will realize that again, we know tension. We can substitute in right there. And the only thing we don't know is that normal force in the right direction and we could solve for it. Now again, it wasn't asked of us here, but had it been, we could have got there. So had we been asked for the normal force, this is one of the questions that students struggle with the most. Because if you're asked for that normal force, you actually can't solve for it first because you actually had to solve for the tension first from the sum of the torques equation before you could then substitute it back into either one of these to be able to solve for those normal forces. And so if you're asked for the tension and then for the normal forces, not so bad because you, you start with that tension and you get it and then you move on to the normal forces. But if the only question you were asked is what is the normal force, that's where students struggle because they gotta first realize that, oh, I've got three variables and three equations. How do I solve for the normal force that I want? And you have to realize that, oh, I gotta solve for the tension so from the first equation, uh, some of the torques first, and then substitute it in to get either one of those other two normal forces. 
If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.